But our next speaker today is Matt Cross. He is the Director of Vertebrate Conservation at the Toledo Zoo, where he oversees their vertebrate research projects and head starting programs. He holds a master's degrees in conservation biology and geographic information sciences from Central Michigan University and received his PhD in ecology from Bowling Green State University. His work primarily focuses on the population and landscape ecology of reptiles with a strong outreach component. Yay, we're on reptiles finally today. <laughs> um, some of his projects include surveys and population assessments for rare reptiles and amphibians, spatial ecology of turtles and snakes, effects of management on turtles, distribution modeling for rare species, and if that was not enough, use of community science and long-term monitoring. In his spare time, Matt enjoys games, Dungeon and Dragons, beer tasting, and building blanket forts with kids. I totally get that. <laughs> so please help me in welcoming Matt, and let's learn about Kirtland's snake today. All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, that's a mouthful. I need to work on that bio. Um, I got, my name is Matt Cross. I'm from Slido Zoo, and um, today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing in Ohio with Kirtland's snake. Um, this has been a really fun journey for us uh, in, in the state and me personally. And honestly, this all started in Michigan. I, I caught my first Kirtland snake in 2007 while I was doing massive saga work. Um, I didn't see one before then. And uh, then once I got to Thiddo Zoo, almost a decade later, I had an opportunity to kind of do some work with this and uh, really, <clears throat> really interesting, fascinating species of snake. So uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with the Kirtland snake, uh, Kirtland snakes, they're pretty small. Uh, on, your, on the screen here is a, a pretty good example of uh, the distinguishing features on them. Uh, they get to be 12 to 15, inch, 15 inches long. Um, they're pretty skinny about the width of a pencil. Uh, you know, on average, our big adults, our, our gravid females are pushing like 32, 36 grams. Um, so they're, they're, decent, they're, they're pretty small. Um, they've got a really nice yellowish, uh, or sorry, quick brief, <laughs> space my colors, reddish colored uh, belly uh, with a line of black dots down either side. Um, you know, they've got the black splotches along their back, kind of on a, like a grayish or brownish backdrop. Um, so they're really a very unique looking snake. If you find them, they tend to be fossorial. So they prefer more moist, moist soils. So their habitat types tend to be these um, open wet prairies, um, to some extent forested, wet, wet forested areas, more like these open sites. Um, and they have this association with crayfish burrows or crayfish. And um, uh, this is kind of you know part of the reason why we don't see them very often. They they spend a lot of their time undercover or in for crayfish burrows. We think in Ohio they've been listed as threatened. Uh, there's been their, their habitat has declined. You know like like any like many species, especially our wetland species, uh, even wet prairies. You know in Ohio we lost ninety two percent of our historic wetlands, mostly to the loss of the Great Black Swamp. Um, but, you know, there would have been associated habitat with this, uh, that in these transitional areas and these wet prairies. Uh, so this species, especially in Ohio, has seen a very uh, large scale decline. Currently, they're not federally listed. Uh, they were put there. The petition went through in 2017. They made a decision. And uh, but we'll talk about that here a little bit later. So in Ohio, one of the big questions we have or the Division of Wildlife and anyone really has had in the state is you know what are the status of these populations? So um, more than 75% of our records in Ohio are more than 28 years old. And that's when I would have made the slide, which means they're now more than 30 years old. Um, so we we know that they've, uh, they've been found throughout the state, especially over here um, in our glaciated regions and whatnot, but we have not had a lot of follow-up and sightings have been very sporadic and intermittent. Um, over the decades. So uh, Roger Conant, he did a great, great uh, work in Ohio uh, in terms of re uh, reptiles of Ohio, uh, cataloging and um, surveying reptiles and amphibians in the state. Uh, but even, you know, that was 1948, 1950. Uh, so there's some of these places that haven't been uh, updated since, uh, you know, since then. And even in a lot of our, our sightings are, are very, very dated. Uh, and there's a lot of, that have, a lot of habitat has changed. And in, in Ohio, only nine of our sites have been revisited since their initial, their original reports of snakes in the, in the area. Now, there have been some updates uh, in, in recent years. So uh, from some of these counties, we've had some more recent sightings. But in general, we know Kirtland snake are in this, the snakes in the state, but we don't have a really good feel for um, where, how many, 
Um, we just know they exist pretty much. Uh, so what does Kirtland snake habitat look like? Like I said, um, it runs the gamut from these wet prairies to you know some kind of like transitional areas and wooded wetlands. On the left, we have an emerging wetland next to a road with some really diverse wet, uh, uh, plant types. In the middle, we have a, uh, a place where it's uh, kind of like more classic wetland. You got this, this open watery area, so it's dominated by this, um, this wetland, uh, wet vegetation and mosses. And then over here on the right is kind of this transitional forested wetland where uh, you've got, uh, it's, it's wet seasonally, um, but we, so they, we still find Kirtland snakes there early on. Eventually, uh, you know, plants grow up and these areas change dramatically throughout the season. So they lose their water. Um, the plants make it so that the, the low basking areas are, um, are minimized. And so you, even in these, in these habitats where we find the snakes, we see a lot of changes in vegetation that in a short period of time that can influence their detectability. So uh, a snake that's, a, you know, the size of, you know, two, about a foot long, um, can really hide and spend most of the time underground, can hide anywhere it wants, especially if we're talking areas like this where uh, the vegetation is very, very high. Um, and so it, it makes it very difficult to survey for the species. In general, they they like they they seem to prefer habitats where, or at least we think it's, they seem to prefer habitats where there's a lot of diversity in terms of rare species. This is one of our uh, places where we find Kirtland snake in Ohio. And uh, we find a lot of other rare and unique species along with it. So we get in the, in the same habitat under the same cover boards, we found queen snakes. Uh, I just tuned in at the very end of here. This is part of the, um, the blue spotted complex. I have no idea which one it is, uh, other than it was one of the few salamanders we got out there. We have fox snakes, butler's garter snakes, and um, we'll pretend that I haven't tripped over prairie fringed orchids while I'm looking for snakes. So, uh, the, their habitats tend to be, they, they vary a lot. And one of the biggest threats, sorry, this is a really grainy photo, but this is from, a, from one of the previous study sites. Um, one of the biggest threats now, other than land conversion, uh, since that has seemed to have kind of slowed down since, our, since we tiled the wetlands and whatnot, is habitat succession. So this is a former Kirtland snake site. It was an open prairie and it's just, it was previously managed. And because of lack of management, it's only spray managed and buckthorn has taken over and it's no longer, I mean, we might find snakes here, but in general, we would look at this and probably say this isn't suitable for Kirtland snake. Um, this, uh, Kirtland snakes are probably a uh, victim of decreasing resources available for habitat management, you know, so we, we know we have, we have these snakes in these open prairies and these open areas and, you know, everyone is spread very thin, especially in terms of time and resources. And where they get allocated, and we, we, you know, they might blink out uh, when we when we see things like this. Um, but Kirtland snake, they're 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 kind of a puzzle to me, and I think to a lot of people in terms of habitat, because we've seen these pristine kind of habitats where we expect to find them, where there's a lot of biodiversity and a lot a lot going on. But then we also have cases like this. This is a road in Ohio, where a herpetologist has found Kirtland snake crossing the road uh, there's there's nothing about this site that screams habitat it's an agricultural field a ditch a road and a very small woodlot so none of this is what we think of these open prairie habitats where we would expect to find these uh, habitat specialists like the Kirtland snake so um, are they living in the ditch if so Ohio has no shortage of ditches much like I assume Michigan doesn't so why aren't they all over the place uh, the soils in here, the same dominant soil type as the entire area. Um, there are no other known Kirtland snake sites near this, and yet they've been found here, especially crossing the road. So this is, is this a fluke that's, you know, a remnant population, they're on their way out, we just happen to be catching a few individuals. Or are they able to make use of these uh, subpar habitats like a ditch and persist for uh, long periods of time? Uh, this continues, you know, this is a, a, tr a walking trail in Cincinnati. This is in, in Cincinnati proper, not like a, you know, rural suburb of Cincinnati. Where Kirtland snakes have been found underneath this rock next to the walking trail. 
Similar thing here, right next to a road, they, the snakes have been found underneath rocks just right along the road. Uh, this is not where we would typically expect to find them. You know, they, uh, Again, these open wet uh, prairie habitats are what we, the literature says, where we find the most of them. And even, <laughs> even more amusing, uh, this is an open area, this is an open field that has a bunch of trash. And our herpetologist has found them under bed skirts, under boards, uh, even under old couches. Uh, they're, and this is, this is right smack in, in downtown Cincinnati. And so uh, when we start trying to figure out with an, in a state, you know, we'll use how an example of where these, these snakes are and how to assess their populations, um, they could, it seems like they could be literally anywhere. So uh, we just kind of started in Ohio, uh, just doing some basic surveys. Uh, we tried a variety of cover board objects, artificial cover objects. You can actually see me putting out cover boards um, on our Google Earth satellite, which are Google Earth, which is interesting and concerning all at the same time. But, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of people and the, the efficacy of cover board surveys or artificial cover objects runs the gamut. And there seems to be a lot of regional variation in terms of what works. So we've had great success with um, pieces of wood or tin. Uh, in Michigan, I had great success with carpet. Uh, there are uh, people in Ohio, Greg uh, Lips and Doug Wynn. Uh, I subscribe to their Church of Tin. Tin works great in Ohio. I tried it in Michigan for Massasaugas, and I didn't much luck. Uh, there's a guy in Indiana who claims that foam, uh, padded foam sheets work out really well. So I really don't know uh, what the answer is there, other than um, they just like cover. So we we put a lot of, we put out a lot of um, transects and arrays. In, at historic uh, locations throughout Ohio or throughout Northwest Ohio and Toledo area, and um, you know surveyed to you know try to find our the Kirtland snake, and we had some pretty decent success at some sites. Um, most of our sites we just got nothing, uh, but other places we got some we got some very robust individuals, really really awesome looking snakes. Uh, okay. But what still fascinates me going back to this, you know, where do we actually find these these snakes? Uh, is this is one of my survey sites that uh, this is a ditch next to a parking lot. Uh, the ditch is 158 feet long. It's not very wide. I mean, you can see my cover objects. Um, it's, it's just wide enough that the me that thinks that I'm not 40 years old thinks that I can jump it. Um, so there, there really isn't much habitat here. It's not even like a, I wouldn't even call it a ditch. It's a low wet spot. Um, and in from 2018 to 2021, we captured... 87 snakes, we pit tagged 53. Uh, I'd love it if they're all pit tagged, but sometimes I get uh, technicians and volunteers who are a little bit squeamish about pit tagging uh, snakes that are skinnier than a pencil. Um, we had 10 recaptures over the, over the, in that time. So um, this is a, a spot where we find a lot of snakes and there's nothing special about it. It's, it's next to a parking lot that's by a, a fishing pond and I, it's it's really hard to explain because there's really there's nothing here that makes me say yeah this is exactly where you'd expect to find um, Kirtland snakes. So our cover object surveys spawned uh, you know some more pro side projects. So we started working on uh, redo telemetry. So for a while we we're putting very small transmitters on some of our larger snakes to track them in their habitat to see um, you know what their space use looked like, where they were going, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we used very, very small transmitters that I was modifying. So I'd, uh, these were left over from a project that uh, my predecessor used. So um, I just took out the old battery, carefully soldered in a new battery that was a little bit larger. And I think my longest tracking bout with the Kirtland snake was about 40-ish days. Um, but as you can imagine, tracking something that's fossorial the size of a about a foot long is um, it, it, very time consuming and frustrating. But we did get some very uh, unique information. Uh, I mean, we, we, we know that they have this association with crayfish burrows, um, but I never really expected to see them in crayfish burrows like this. And it was really, what was very interesting is they, oh, without anthropomorphizing, they always seem very curious. Like as, you, as I approached the burrow, their head would pop out and then they would duck back down. Uh, so it just just very interesting. And um, a lot, this is one of those things that it, there's a lot more questions than answers. So a lot of times we find them under cover boards, or you can see in the lower right-hand corner, we find them in these crayfish burrows. They are uh, blue, meaning they're getting ready to slough or shed their skin. Um, so they're in these areas looking for nice, moist places. 
And uh, you, there's there's been a lot of discussion, you know, in the in the history of Kirtland snakes. You know, Kirtland snakes using these crayfish burrows, and this always kind of brought to mind this um this old relationship. And I'm sure there are better ones of you know this relationship that Tuatara had in New Zealand, where they thought that they they shared the the burrow with the birds, and there was this completely amicable relationship where when one wasn't there, the other one was, and they were it was essentially a bird Tuatara timeshare. And they just catalog amicably. And I think we now know that it's more like this. And so this is this kind of got us going uh, down this, this road with the Kirtland snake, where uh, as we started doing more research, we started encountering them more and handling them more, we started to see uh, they would start regurgitating um, crayfish, partially just digested crayfish. Uh, this, the first day we did it, my, my colleague here, he was one of my fellow grad students, this thing started peeking up a crayfish. I'm like, I need your hand. And I uh, just kind of milked it out of his hand. So he made sure to let him know his hand would be famous because uh, he was really, really grossed out. But then where else to put it? Uh, so we started seeing between ourselves and our colleagues down in the southern part of the state, more, uh, you know, in one year, we had a handful of instances where Kirtland snakes were regurgitating uh, partially digested crayfish. And it was, this was only reported once in their diet prior to this by um, Babbitts in 1970s from a museum specimen. And so it's kind of, you know, kind of leaning more now towards they're not just using these abandoned burrows or these burrows for whatever, like they might actually be preying on the crayfish. What's really unique about crayfish is as part of their molting cycle, they, they molt their skin and they have these, these structures in, internally called gastroliths. These little um, concave uh, calcium deposits that after they, 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 they molt, they rapidly absorb those calcium deposits and put it into the new uh, carapace. And you can detect these on, um, on x-rays. They've done this with queen snakes. Queen snakes are almost obligate crayfish eaters. And once we saw that the, the Kirtland snakes were regurgitating, we started taking radiographs. And so you can see here, this is a snake that has two gastroliths in its, its intestines. They're, they're typically pretty small, um, but we did get one snake that regurgitated some, some fairly massive uh, gastroliths. And then I went down the whole gastrolith rabbit hole. So I wanted to make sure that what we were doing, so I, I radiographed um, a series of crayfish so you could see the uh, the, um, the gastroliths in there wanted to make sure that I wasn't mistaking gastroliths for something else and so they looked very different from rocks and then worked with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History to get a bunch of their Kirtland snake specimens and started looking at prevalence of gastroliths in the, the digestive tracts of museum specimens and this was the only one you can find you can kind of see there in the middle um and I'll, I'll never find the laser pointer I don't know if you guys can see my mouth, but right, mouth right there in the middle of there's a little round shape um, that to me looks like a gastrolith. And we didn't really find a lot of snakes in there in their collection that had gastroliths, but uh, it was it was definitely a fun little side project. I talked with the crayfish expert in Ohio, and uh, he I sent him some specimens from, I sent him our regurgitate specimens and some specimens we collected from the site. And he identified it as a uh, digger crayfish, um, phallocambrous spodians. Uh, and he's he's the expert. I, I don't doubt him. He's, he lives, breathes, and eats crayfish. Uh, they have a very similar uh, distribution in Ohio to Kirtland snake. Now they we see them more on the east side of the state, where um, we haven't seen we don't see that as much uh, with the, with the uh, Kirtland snake, but uh, definitely have a very similar range and similar habitat. So the digger crayfish uh, is one of uh, our our top in our our top ten uh, species of greatest conservation need in Ohio for uh, yeah, in, in crayfish, sorry. Uh, their, their population trend is declining and their habitat association are, are these wet prairies and these, um, these slow moving waterways. And so got these two species that, you know, one seems to depend on the other, they feed on the other. And so this is um, moving forward, the relationship between these two species is something we really hope to explore. Our Kirtland snake reproduction, uh, this was kind of fun because this, you know, the, the diet, and then re the reproduction of these snakes. In general, when you look, there's not a whole lot known about this species. Uh, so in 2020, when I found two snakes copulating on the cover board, I was super excited. I found a couple more. And uh, this was a, just a very interesting story from just a, a fun like little kid kind of thing. Uh, so uh, a lot. So most notably, in red, uh, this has been described in red-sided garter snakes, 
is what are called copulatory plugs. These are um, a form of sexual or sperm competition where the male implants this thick gelatinous plug in the female's cloaca. That's just a physical barrier to prevent other males from copulating. This breaks down or they can expel it in about like 72-ish hours. And but by that time, you know, mates have moved on and it kind of assures that that males um uh, he gets, he gets, he gets access to that female that he's that they're, he's passing on his genes. And so I found a couple of snakes that had something sticking out of his cloaca like this. And at first I thought, man, this must be, is this what a partially digested gastrolith looks like? And I, um, I, I teased them out. And then it was, as I was walking away, I was like, that reminds me of something I saw once. And so down there in the left part of the screen, those are some, what I you know, mistakenly thought were gastroliths. Um, early on, and we're actually, I, we're actually what I thought, copulatory plugs. So I had to wait a year to go back, and oh, there we go. And sure enough, we've uh, I found a, a pair of Kirtland snakes that were copulating. Uh, I put them in a herps in a, in a herp sack for let them sit there for about an hour. Went back, and sure enough, the female had this um, noticeable copulatory plug, very similar to what we see in the red sided garter snake. So this is something that. We hadn't, we didn't really know about this species. A lot of snakes probably use copulatory plugs, but this was kind of a really fun little discovery. In addition to the reproductive biology, we've been, we occasionally radiograph them. So on the left here, you can see this is a snake that's developing um, mid season. You can see the uh, ova that are, that are there in her belly. And on the right, this isn't a great picture because I couldn't find the video. We did a radiograph of a very gravid female Kirtland snake. And so that, that line right there, that is her spine. And all those little squiggles is her just full of babies. Uh, it was it was really, really cool. We could actually see them moving around. So I do actually do some real work. Uh, I don't just chase around snakes. Uh, so we did some, some distribution modeling in Ohio for Kirtland snake to try to figure out where we should target future surveys. Uh, we used a, a series of, can of um, habitat layers and we used a multi-model approach that looked uh, to be a little more robust than just a single uh, estimate. And um, this was just an example of kind of what we found in general throughout the range. This is what, was what a lot of habitat looks like. Now, this it's hard scale-wise when you consider that you've got a snake that's small and the pixels here are 30 meters each. But in these areas where we're finding them, there's really not a shortage of high quality habitat, but what it is, it's very spread out. And so our high quality habitat here is in the red, orange is medium, green is low, blue is, there's no reason they should be there, but they might occasionally. Um, and so just, there, there's, there's habitat, there's places for them, uh, but again, it's very spread out. Um, we did some uh, sampling here uh, for an eDNA, or for an eDNA project, and this is kind of where we, this is kind of where we focused. So eDNA, just very briefly, and I hope I don't butcher this, is as organisms move through, through their environment, they, you know, they shed skin, feces, they leave parts of themselves behind that we can hopefully detect by taking samples of the air, water, soil, um, but it does degrade over time. We use this approach in Ohio to look at, uh, we started out with, with um, uh, sampling crayfish burrows. And this was kind of an arduous task. I don't think we ever tried to go down a crayfish burrow. They zigzag a lot. So I ended up out there with a post hole digger and decided that this was ridiculous. Eventually we just started sampling from water that we could see that was available. And then we extracted it all across filter paper in our lab. Then our partners uh, uh, did the genetic analyses to look for Kirtland snake through uh, the, the detection uh, places where we, we brought the, got the water samples. And overall, we detected Kirtland snake at six sites. And I'm going to go to the next slide because try as I might, I've not, I've never been able to figure out what they circled in this slide. Um, but this is slightly more informative. So we had all these sampling sites throughout the range, and we ended up kept detecting um, uh, snakes all over the place. We got Kirtland snakes detected at four sites. I think there's a mismatch here between our four and our six because they might have counted. Uh, a, like sites that were separate as one or vice versa. But overall, this is kind of, it was a good exercise. We got detections, but it's still, um, it didn't really help. It didn't answer any of our, our, our questions in terms of where snakes actually are, but it's a definitely a great, great way to use multiple methods. Uh, Mark Jordan at Purdue has done some really interesting follow-up work with uh, Kirtland snake eDNA. 
so with all, well, we go through all this, we know where snakes are. Um, we've, we've got a lot of information on them now, but we have talked about that listing decision. So in 2017, the Kirtland snake, it was decided that, you know, we don't have, you know, that it didn't merit listing under the Endangered Species Act. And, um, you know, I was kind of disappointed. And, but the punchline from all their findings is it's, it's, it was data deficient. So you have, a, you have a snake that we almost know nothing about and there wasn't evidence to support the listing decision. And so right now they're actually, I think um, the Center for Biological Diversity is suing the, fed, the feds for not listing them. So I don't know what the end result of that will be, but they're, um, we're still working on it. So this is, you know, all of the work we've been doing is trying to help out these listing decisions so this comes, you know, what do we do to change data deficient when it comes to this kind of thing? And this is a fun story about our, our outreach where we had a we had a picture someone sent us of this snake they found while they were kayaking. And so I put out cover boards at the site. I could not find a snake there to save my life. And then I get a call from a 15-year-old who's fishing out there, or his mom. She's like, yeah, my son was fishing. He saw your boards. He likes snakes. He couldn't help himself because they say do not disturb on them. And he found this, and he found two Kirtland snakes. And I'd been spending the entire summer there. So I gave him stuff to, to me sex measure way and pit tag snakes. And he would catch snakes for me while he went fishing. And so this was actually a new county record. And we published this in Herp Review. So this 15-year-old has a publication to his name now uh, from helping me out do these Kirtland snake surveys. And the more you get people involved, the more we, you, you find them. So around the same time, people knew we were looking for these snakes. We got a phone call from a mosque and you see here, he's pointing at the water fountain. There was a Kirtland snake that was coming up from the water fountain. And um, I, so this was news. Everyone was just like, what's going on here? Well, then about a couple of days later, right across the street, I got another, uh, we got another sighting about from a, a, a someone who sent it to the zoo about it. She thought it was a red belly snake. Well, no, that's a Kirtland. And so just by getting the word out there, you can, we can get more information and identify places where we can go survey. A really great example was done by my colleague, Megan Seymour here in Ohio for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where she trained volunteers in surveys and, de and decontamination protocols and essentially gave people cover boards. So they came to a brief workshop, learned the methods, and then Megan turned them loose on their property. So they found, they, they surveyed 37 sites in 19 counties with 29 volunteers. 600 snakes of nine species were documented, 89 Kirtland snakes in, at 13 sites in seven counties, and one was a new county record. This is this is awesome, you know. So by getting people involved is a great way to get data on these uh, these cryptic species. And so we have a site at the zoo where people can go submit their observations. This is um, a partnership with Herp Mapper, and so people can submit their observations. We can. We have access to the data. And so any of these, these sites, especially Hurt Mapper, because it's really good about obscuring locations and, and um, verifying uh, submissions are great ways for people to get involved and help out with uh, species like this. And this is just fun for the whole family. My kids get involved in it. They, you know, they hold, they've held their own snakes, species that no one ever, might have ever seen before. So um, we really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. And I think I'm pretty close to my time here because I started my thing late. So uh, acknowledge all these people. And if we have time for quick questions, I'll take some quick questions. We have time. I love that picture. Um, I did put into the chat on Zoom the Michigan Herp Atlas uh, website, which you can also submit records there. We also have Herp Mapper through Michigan as well, if you live in Michigan. Uh, yes, great plug for citizen science. I love it, Matt. Um, the question, one question we have in the chat, have there been any efforts to reinduce Kirtland snakes to areas that have they have been extirpated from? And if so, what is the outcome? To the best of my knowledge, no. Um, I could always be wrong, but um, I, I, I don't know of any yet. And we haven't, we haven't started. I think one of the big barriers, again, is we don't have a good feel for what the populations are like. And if they can persist in these small isolated areas, um, are they doing okay? If, they're, if they can survive in ditches, are they the seagulls of snakes and they're all over the place? Um, I don't think that's the case, but if they are using ditches, then us dumping a bunch of snakes back into a subpar habitat um, is really, might not necessarily do anyone any good. So we need a lot more information, I think, before we can start talking about reintroducing uh, something like Kirtland snake. 
sounds like uh, we need a lot of citizen scientists helping us out, uh, people really looking for these snakes. Um, we have, uh, this was totally a question I was gonna ask. Um, one question that came through the Q&A, uh, do you always use uh, corrugated metal cover boards? What material, size, et cetera, do you recommend? So like I said, it seems to vary regionally. Um, we use the corrugated metal um, four by four, so we'll cut the eight foot sheets in half. But I've also had luck using um, two by two pieces of plywood. And even at my one main study site, I have found them under beer cans, um, small rocks. Uh, they, they don't seem to be too discriminating. Uh, so I guess it really depends on what fits the project, what's easiest for you to transport, because those four by four sheets of, ply of corrugated steel can be a, a bear to haul out into some remote sites. Um, but yeah, you can email me. There's, uh, yeah, there's, there's, we could talk about this for a whole other, whole other discussion topic. <laughs> yes, and I will share Matt's email uh, in the follow-up email, and I'll put it in the chat in just a sec too. Um, one last question: Do you have any over? Uh, do you have any overlap with Massasaugas and the places where you study? Has this ever been an issue when doing citizen science research? Not so. The the Kirtland Lake and Massasauga do overlap in some areas. In Ohio, our Massasauga populations are so limited that our community scientists haven't necessarily had to worry about that. But as part of Megan's training, um, I believe identification of snakes is the first thing. You know, also, if you don't know what it is, don't touch it. Here's the difference between these snakes. Um, so especially going forward, yeah, places in Michigan where I think Massasaugas and Kirtland snake tend to have be in the same habitats or very similar habitats, um, making sure community scientists are very keenly aware of the uh, how to ID snakes would be uh, critical to avoid any, uh, any issues. Yeah, great point. Awesome. Well, thank you, Matt, so much for all your great knowledge. I know I learned a lot about Kirtland snakes that I didn't know much. There's there's not a lot out there, as you said. So hopefully we can learn some more in the next so many years uh, from the great work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So